Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here today, sharing some historical insight um, with a room full of people who will be creating the technological future. My name is Eden Medina, and I'm a professor of informatics and computing, and I'm also a historian of technology. And the fact is that while we're often told that the past holds lessons for the present, we rarely look to older technologies for inspiration. Rarer still do we look to the experiences of less industrialized nations um, for how to approach the technological challenges of today. So in my talk, I'm going to share with you the experiences of a South American nation from the 1970s with computer technology, and I'm going to argue that those experiences are as relevant today as they were four decades prior. In particular, I'm going to talk to you about Project CyberSyn. Um, project CyberSyn was a project to help Chile in the early 1970s regulate their national economy. And I put this slide up here because it gives you a sense of how Chile's designers envisioned the future in all of its 1970s wood-paneled glory. Now, Project Cybersyn was a utopian technological project that was attached to a utopian political project. In particular, it was attached to Chile's peaceful road to socialism. For those of you who don't know, in 1970, the Chilean candidate for presidency won the election on a promise to create a fundamentally different society. Chile would become socialist, but it would also respect its existing constitution, as well as civil liberties, such as freedom of the press and freedom of, the spe freedom of speech. Now, Allende wanted to give the state control of Chile's most important industries, but this created managerial difficulties. First, the state had limited experience in this area, and second, the size of the state-run sector was growing at an enormous rate, to give you an example, by the end of 1971, the government had taken control of 150 enterprises, including 12 of the 20 largest companies in Chile. And this managerial problem led a young Chilean engineer named Fernando Flores to contact a British cybernetician named Stafford Beer and ask for advice. And indeed, the name Fernando Flores might be familiar to some of you because of the work he would go on to do with Terry Winograd um, and the book that they would co-author, Understanding Computers and Cognition. Um, here's a picture of how Stafford Beer looked in 2001, a year before his death. Um, I put this picture up here because it'll give you a sense of the kind of person he was. Um, and indeed, in some ways, he looked similar when he was working in Chile. He was very well known for his long beard, and he also had distinguishing habits, so he would always be smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and, and eating chocolates. Um, so Stafford Beer arrived in Chile in 1971, and with Flores, they started to put together a team of Chilean and British engineers, a very talented group of engineers. And they also started to conceptualize how they would build this project. Um, and they called this new system Project Cybersyn. It was a combination of two terms, cybernetics, so the science that was the basis, and synergy, the idea that the whole was more than the sum of the parts. And they conceptualized this system as a way to give the government access to factory production data on a daily basis which was a significant improvement over what they had before. And they also wanted to design a set of computer-based tools for the government that would help them predict future economic behavior. Um, to look at it in one way, it was an early form of, of algorithmic regulation, whereby the system would give the government um, access to production data in real time, or what was considered real time in Chile in the early 1970s, um, and would look for anomalies in that data and would generate alerts that government officials could respond to and make decisions more effectively. Now, I stumbled across the Cybersyn project when I was researching the history of computing in Latin America. And I was so taken by it that I spent 10 years compiling its history, which I published as the book Cybernetic Revolutionaries with MIT Press. Um, and don't worry, I was doing other things during that time period, too. I wasn't just writing the book. 
But one of the things that I found interesting is that we often talk about computers as technologies of revolution, as revolutionary technologies. But in this case, we had a computer system that was actually used for revolution in the political sense. And I thought that was fascinating. So in my talk, I'm going to present two lessons from the Cybersyn history. And there are actually there are a lot of lessons that I could draw out of this history about privacy, algorithmic transparency, et cetera. But I want to add two things that I feel have not been part of these discussions and put them, give them more prominence. So in particular, I'm going to argue, I'm going to use this history, to show that older technologies have value. They can help us solve problems while cutting down on cost and generating less waste. And then I also want to make a, a few comments um, about the dangers of design bias and why we need to be so aware about the potential of design bias. OK, the first lesson. We can create cutting edge systems using older technologies. Project Cybersyn was built in the early 1970s. And in that time, Chile had 50 computers in the entire country. The government, National Computer Enterprise, had four computers. And of those computers, they gave the Cybersyn team access to one. And so this meant that Beer and his engineering team had to create a very ingenious solution to the problem that they were facing. And what they did is they took the one computer that they had available to them, which was not state of the art, and they hooked it up to another technology, which was not state of the art, a telex machine, or rather several hundred of them. And to give you an idea of how creative a solution this was, in essence, they created a national computer network to send information across the country using one computer. So that is my engineering challenge to you, right? In the 1970s, if they could build a network with one computer, imagine what we can do today. Um, and the thing is that this system worked. It allowed the government to transmit messages with a speed and dynamism they didn't have previously. In 1972, when a national strike threatened to bring the government to an early end, the government used this system to find out what roads were open, how to distribute the materials they had, how to maintain production. The system helped the government survive. Here's another example. If you recall back to the image of the Cybersyn operations room that I showed you, you'll remember those screens that were along the walls of the room that looked like television screens. Televisions were hard to come by in Chile during this time period, as, as were television components. So the designers did a pretty clever trick. They took an older technology, the slide projector, and you can see in the floor plan, they placed a series of three slide projectors behind the wall of the room, which they used to back project economic data onto acrylic screens. And in this way, they were able to simulate high-tech displays. So Project Cybersyn illustrates that sophisticated, even futuristic systems can be built using simple technologies. Older technologies can be re-envisioned or recycled even to create new cutting edge systems, especially if we think of combining technologies with other forms of organizational and social innovation. The current market for electronic products depends on planned obsolescence. Older technologies quickly become out of date and unfashionable. Yet we're becoming increasingly aware that newer technologies also have a cost, and that cost is e-waste. Expanding the life of our electronic devices can address the e-waste problem. We can connect our technological future to our technological past. My next point, we need to be vigilant about bias in system design. It is hard to design systems without bias. Inherited biases are not going to be shed overnight. We need, and for this reason, we need to remain vigilant about the ways that bias can enter into and shape system design. Because left unchecked, our technologies can marginalize and exclude sectors of our population. And here, Project Cybersyn also offers important insights. So let's talk about the operations room. Um, this was designed in very explicit ways to be a space for democratic participation. 
And you can see this, for example, because there are seven chairs in an inward-facing circle. Seven, because it facilitates voting, it's an odd number. A circle, no one member would be privileged above the other members. You may also notice that there's no table in the middle. Um, the Chilean designers believe that if there was a table, it would encourage people to bring papers. And if there are papers, people are going to spend time shuffling the papers and looking at the papers instead of actually talking to each other. So the table was eliminated as a way to encourage people to talk to one another and share their ideas, which I think is a, is a pretty interesting idea. Um, early plans for the room even included a minibar. Um, the panels in the room were designed to display economic data, but they also showed areas in need of urgent government attention. The designers use light and color and motion as a way to convey what the data meant and to help the occupants of the room understand what was going on in as little time as possible. So thus, it should not be a surprise that the chairs in the room illustrated the same hallmarks of careful design thinking. Occupants, for example, would navigate the content of the displays using large geometric buttons that were built into the armrest of the chair. Um, instead of the traditional keyboard, you would think that they would use a keyboard instead. And this design decision re reflected the class consciousness of the design team. Because when they were thinking about who would be using the room, Chilean workers was one of the first groups that came to their mind. And Chilean workers would not have experience using a keyboard. So the room was designed to facilitate worker participation. The other group that the designers envisioned using the room were high-level government officials. And they, too, would not have experience using a keyboard, albeit for a very different reason. They had female secretaries. So when they were reflecting on whether or not they should use the keyboard or not in the room, Beer noted, that such a decision to use a keyboard would insinuate a girl between themselves and the machinery when it is vital that the occupants interact directly with the machine and with each other. So a design decision to try to make a system more user-friendly actually ended up removing female clerical workers from a decision-making space. And, and the observation becomes even more interesting when you think about another reason the team decided to adopt these buttons. It was because if you wanted to emphasize your point, these buttons encouraged you to pound on the armrest. Okay? The, the word that the designers actually used was thump. Stafford Beer said that you could thump on the armrest if you wanted to make your point. And that's a very gendered form of, of, of expression, right? It is more akin to a masculine form of expression than a gender neutral um, or even feminine form of expression. Such design decisions were not neutral. They reflected who the design team envisioned would hold power, decision-making power, in Chile's revolutionary project. Workers, mostly male workers, um, and government bureaucrats would hold power. Um, clerical workers, other kinds of workers, and women would not. Um, and these design decisions illustrate not only a shortcoming in Chile's revolutionary imagination, I would throw it up there to show they, they illustrate how our ideas about gender and class travel with us and shape the way that we design our technologies, even when the technology is something as ambitious as a futuristic, utopian system um, for a, a, a new kind of modernity. Okay. So I'm going to conclude with this screenshot of a movie that Stafford Beer made in 1974. And he made this, this movie because he was hoping to convey his experiences with the Cybersyn Project to a larger audience. And 40 years later, I'm here doing something similar. And I'm doing it because the challenges that Cybersyn's protagonists faced were not unique to their era. Indeed, we continue to face similar challenges. I've shared with you two, but as I've alluded to, there are more. And while the project was far from perfect, it continues to hold lessons for those who are interested in designing technologies for a better future. We have a lot to learn from our cybernetic past. And as I hope I have shared with you today, that past is global. Thank you. <laughs>